like to ask, start asking you a few questions, if I could, Don, about your father. Not long ago, we found out that your father was actually, actually put Project Sign together and started Project <coughs> Sign. Uh, first, what I would like to ask you is if you could describe your father, what he was like as a father, what he looked like, um, what he enjoyed doing. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, a tough question. Uh, he was a 110% uh, uh, German. And uh, because I carry those genes too, his father came over from Hanover, Germany. We traced him back that way. So he was uh, had a mind of his own. You might say he could have been stubborn, but he's a very dedicated man. As from a religious point of view, we're, we're all raised Catholics, and he was too, of course. And so he had this uh, mindset that uh, he was a workaholic. He worked very. Uh, Hard trying to do what he thought was best. Uh, uh, he was not a politician. Uh, as the expression go, he would be the first one to piss off the Pope in the <laughs> <laughs> for a conversation. And he just said what he wanted, and uh, he had a very uh, uh, narrow lip, and so his smile would uh, wouldn't often see it. He was very dedicated to his work, and he always talked about uh, aviation and, and nautical and, and aeronautical things. Uh, he had a few close friends, not many. He was an automobile freak. He always loved the big Bjorks, the big cars. And he always, in the spare time, was working on them, changing spark plugs and, and uh, changing oil and doing anything, mechanical things. Do you remember any of uh, any of your father's friends' names? Yeah, there was um, uh, a fellow by the name of Murray who lived in uh, Dayton, Ohio, that just kind of behind this house that our folks rented. Did, did he work at that? No, I forget um, whether Mr. Murray worked in the right pad or not. But they would just uh, joke along with each other, and they were the first ones that have a TV set would go over and watch the black and white flash away in a darkened room. Uh, there was another one, um, I got his name now, but uh, they were kind of uh, uh, friends too. I think it was, I'm going to say Johnson, but I might be off on that. And he had just a, a handful of friends, and I uh, spent some uh, limited time with them. Uh, most, most what did he do with his friends? Did, did they travel together? <clears throat> well, the, um, I think the Murrays that came out here in 1948 and went over the Pikes Peak, he just bought a brand new 48 Plymouth and made a trip out west and, uh, for a couple of weeks. But that was about the only trip I remember with, uh, with his friend, if I recall. He didn't really take vacations. And the only time uh, we got together as a family was once in a while, Friday night for dinner. Of course, it was a fish dinner in those days. Then uh, Sunday afternoons was the family drive, which my brother and I would usually end up being hands in the back of the car waiting for my dad to get ready. And so he'd end up uh, swacking us uh, in the back seat as we drove along. And usually family drive ended up with a big family argument. But uh, we you know, would go to church Sunday morning, and then in the afternoon we'd have the famous family drive. And um, it was a big Buicks. <clears throat> yeah, it was a big car, big Buick, and um, and of course when he left the uh, Bright Pat and got the job with Unexcelled Chemical Corporation, he got himself a nice big 1951 uh, Cadillac, a baby blue. Where where did you go on your Sunday drive? Well, um, just driving. And the areas in Dayton, Ohio, not too far away, it would be about an hour to hour drive. So, the, so on Sundays was about the only time you really got to interact with your dad? Yeah, and that was uh, family time. Once in a while, it would be a, a Friday evening dinner, uh, some restaurant, a fish dinner, and then we'd go over to uh, the Murray's house. And I'm trying to remember the other man's name, but uh, we didn't see them as often as I think Murray was probably his best friend. He would talk uh, once in a while about his uh, work, but not too often. And uh, he was always, uh, we always seemed to have a basement someplace in the homes, and he was always down there working on uh, aircraft drawings, uh, his inventions. And then he, when he started making these solid propellants, he was always pounding uh, solid rockets down in the basement. 
Did you ever have any fear? Maybe there's something you might blow up? <clears throat> well, my mother was always concerned about that. <laughs> and I used to go down and see him pound his rockets and then the sound what black powder was. And I used to steal some of that. And I used to have these little metal uh, airplanes, you know, toy crafts. And uh, one time I went in and got the, my little airplane with like a Corsair. And I got some of this black powder and put it in a little paper bag underneath the wing and then lit a fuse. And unfortunately, the fuse was faster than I was, and it blew up in my face. So I was all blackened from my black powder. What did your dad do? Uh, he didn't know about it. Oh. He didn't know I stole some of his black powder. <laughs> but uh, the fumes, he always had the fumes down the basement of uh, working with uh, testers' uh, cement. He's always building model airplanes. And then plus working with black powder, and I think this was the cause of his uh, his cancer later on. Oh, really? And all those toxic fumes. And uh, but he was a workaholic. He worked up uh, in the basement and always on his drawings, and that was all his time. And when he spent time with me, we'd be talking about hydrals uh, of uh, effective uh, wings and so forth, and some very technical stuff. And I, like a good son, tried to stay awake. <laughs> And, um, but there's very few times that he really would be like um, uh, a good buddy. And a couple of times, being active in the scouts, he would come to some of the meetings where I would uh, give a discussion about making plaster casts of animals in front of the scout uh, group and uh, the parents. And he would come to a couple of those meetings. And I did drag him out to a couple of uh, camp outings where we did some hikes. And he really suffered from those things. He was not an outdoors man. And so, uh, you know, sleeping in the tent and then eating some uh, overcooked fried eggs in the morning or whatever. <laughs> so uh, I've got some old pictures of him with a handkerchief around his forehead, sweating away in the little hike. <laughs> but I think he went out about two camp uh, meetings with me. And, and that was enough for Yeah, him, that was huh? it. And then he'd take me out to these model aircraft meets. Uh, he'd have those in Sunday where they'd fly his uh, rocket-propelled airplanes when it was a kind of a swept wing deal. And everybody would all do that as to take off the solid propellants and he made solid rockets. And then he told me <clears throat> back in those days that the first ones were right, he flew with back in 1938. But when I was, uh, I guess, in uh, grade school, he'd bring me some of these uh, model airplane meets. And, uh, People would be flying gasoline powered motors and, and they could have his rocket engines out there. But he was always told me um, that the problem with solid propellants that it would get uh, cracks and voids in them and they'd cause explosions. And later on, when they got into the space age of rockets, he said that was a problem with the solid propellants. And that's why they switched to liquids because they avoided the problem with detonations. Real tough question here. But I, I need to ask it. Um, you, you say your father was a workaholic. Um, didn't really spend all that much time with him. How did you and Jim feel about that? Well, we had our outside uh, friends. It was um, the Splinter family deal. I, uh, uh, he and my dad never got along too all together. And it was always. Uh, uh, Can you give me a reason? Well, I guess they had a different uh, opinion. Um, Jim finally went to West Point, got appointed to West Point, and uh, they uh, and he was very glad to leave home because he and Dad didn't get along well together. <clears throat> and uh, I guess I was his favorite, but he never did spend that much time with me uh, because I missed that father contact at times. But he was always had his projects, whether it was. Uh, working in the basement and aircraft drawings and <clears throat> aeronautical uh, nature of things, or he was working on this car. And uh, I get to hate the word projects because if I wanted to go play someplace and he wanted me to come on a project, and then I was quarantined until I did some little work like that. So you actually went into the basement and into his workshops? Oh, yeah. I was down there a lot with him and <clears throat> at the time, but he was very busy and he would talk, very technical talk with me at times. Um, a lot of times he'd be working on his, uh, his um, cars and vehicles and so forth. But he always had, uh, he was always busy within himself and never had that much time for family. Of course, my brother and I in grade school, we took piano lessons, and so we'd hammer out uh, 
practice in Japan at times. And my mother worked uh, uh, always in what either bank's uh, Marion. Marion. Marion yeah. And she was a very good tennis player, and uh, she gave it up uh, after she left college. And uh, I said, well, she should have kept it up, and that would have made her live longer, I think. But I've done the same thing. I played a lot of tennis, and I gave it up about uh, eight years ago. I just got burned out of being a tennis player. <laughs> but we do change as we get older. But as, as far as getting back, yeah, getting back to Dad, he was just, uh, uh, he wasn't uh, an easy person to get to know. And our vacations would be, uh, you asked about travel, uh, we'd go to see his uh, his mother in Ambridge, Pennsylvania. And sometimes they'd drop us off there, my brother and I, for about six or eight weeks. And we hated that because uh, we had our cousins to play with, but the farm, which called it, was just a big old family home where uh, Dad was raised in uh, Ambridge, Pennsylvania. And it was just uh, some acreage, a lot of woods and all. It's not really a farm, but we call it the farm. And it was down in a hollow, and, and uh, we used to have to walk over to see our cousins and walk through the cemeteries nearby, and that was our fun for the whole summer. So it was... Uh, but uh, every time Dad wanted to go someplace, he wanted to visit his mother, which didn't go along too well with my mother because his mother, my mother, didn't get along too well together. She was a, uh, a German matriarch, and of course, her husband died when he was about 45 years old. He was a builder in Ambridge, and he died from ruptured appendix. But the German uh, attitude then, you know, you can't be sick, and if you're sick, you're a sissy. So he never did go see the doctor, so he died at the age of 45. But then his wife, uh, my grandmother, dad's mother, then took over the family and raised uh, what, seven children with an iron hand. And you could see the fear of God in their eyes any time we got together. Because no one stepped out of lying from free to Lodi because she'd get maybe old. Or snooping real fast. But the family uh, meetings there in Ambridge when we were there, uh, the family would stay together, and they'd get together, and uh, they'd sing, and one would play the piano. My dad used to play the drums, and so it would be a musical get-together, all the cousins and uncles and aunts and so forth. And uh, then they would always have what they call the lunch at midnight. One of the unlucky uh, hosts, one of the uh, brothers would have the, uh, the group over, and he had to provide a big spread on the dining room table at lunch, and he was like, if it wasn't enough, you'd be hear from the other brothers and sisters. <laughs> sounds, <clears throat> sounds like the family I belong yeah, to. Yeah, right. <laughs> Whenever you put the food out, everybody shows up. <laughs> so that was the extent of the family type vacations, the big visiting, maybe old homestead, and visiting his mother. We know your travel. Your father traveled an awful lot uh, on business. And that, were there any times at all that you can remember that you accompanied him on a business trip? You know, all the, uh, the business trips were um, uh, the government, and they were uh, he was just by himself or with some other uh, people from uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Like but he to, did travel quite a bit, though. I would like to mention some names, and, and if you have any recollection, tell me about those. And if not, that's okay. Have you ever heard of, um, at the time, uh, not recently, but at the time, uh, Colonel Howard McCoy? Yeah, I remember the name McCoy. Did, did he ever come over to the house to your no. no. Uh, how about Albert Yarmouth? No, I didn't mention that. He did mention at times of some uh, colonels he worked for, and he was very unhappy with their, the way they handled their end of the business. Did, did he tell you exactly what was going on that was causing his unhappiness? No, well, <clears throat> he was a civilian. Um, and he always thought the, uh, the military people were incompetent as far as being professional aeronautical engineers and the work that uh, he was doing and trying to get done. As I said, he was a very uh, dedicated man, and he believed in what he was doing. And if anybody else uh, differed with him, they were wrong. Of course, I see that view for myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, your father was a genius when it came to low aspect ratio aircraft and all kinds of other things. Um, and I can understand why he would probably think that military engineers probably just couldn't keep up with him because he was obviously a very forward-thinking 
picky man and as far as designs and things like this one. Is this kind of what... <clears throat> well, he thought the, um, the military uh, people were not really... Uh, I don't know their backgrounds, but I doubt it whether they're professional aeronautical engineers or physicists and so forth. Uh, you know, Einstein had his run-ins with people, too. He was the same way. Uh, and people didn't get along with Einstein either because he had his way of thinking of things. And Dad's, um, he studied what other people were doing, like uh, apparently on his patents about Horton, the German uh, design, but he was up to date in what other countries were doing uh, as far as uh, at the edge of uh, aeronautical designs. He had blank aircraft, and he was the chief stress analysis, and he helped them uh, put together a better aircraft. As a matter of fact, one of the blanket sons called me back in about 1990, ran me down, and he said his dad spoke glowingly about my dad's work with him. Um, Do you remember the name? I forget his first name, but it was a Belanca family, and I think they, they might have done some aircraft work up in Michigan at that time. It's about 1990. I think the dad worked for Belanca in about 1938 or so. I think it was Delaware. But um, <clears throat> just like when dad started using the solid propellants in his uh, model airplanes, that was such a breakthrough, everybody else was using these gasoline engines. And so he was doing something. He was, uh, uh, at that time, maybe 20 years ahead of his time. And <clears throat> he was did, did he ever mention the Horton brothers to you? No. Down in the workshop or anything? No. Uh, as I said, he rarely mentioned anything about uh, work. I remember when uh, Colonel, uh, or Major Sweet it was, was one of his friends in the military, and he was a glider pilot. And one of these uh, aircraft meets, uh, I tried to run down Colonel Sweet to see, or Major Sweet to see if he was still alive, if he remembered anything about my dad's work. But they were, that was probably his closest friend in the military, his friend of the friendly one. And Major Sweet took me up in the glider, they had a glider contest one time. And uh, they stabbed me in the back seat of this glider and they pulled us off and uh, all of a sudden, we started doing spins and the throw out a roll of toilet paper. And I thought, what are you usually doing? I was maybe 12 years old at the time. It throws out a roll of toilet paper out the cockpit, and then makes two tight turns and cuts the, the toilet paper twice with the wingtip. And the interval of time shows whether you win or lose as you're standing with the other glider uh, pilots. Wow, I've never heard that. Yeah, and uh, seeing that toilet paper roll out, and all you saw the horizon and the ground all get mixed up together as you went in a tight spin. And then they had to dive bomb. This is all on a glider, and drop some flour within the target. And then another uh, event was to uh, land in the shortest period of time. Where well, if you've ever been in a glider, you're sitting on a, uh, a board, and then there's a skid and the nose, and there's a small wheel underneath this board you're sitting on. And it's flying over the runway, and they had these wires or string put up, and as soon as you pass that, you're supposed to drop and land at the shortest distance. So they put the spoilers up, which would kill the airflow and the wings, and you drop like a rock. Meanwhile, your rear end is on this board, which is right next to the ground. <clears throat> and it was quite a shock to... Uh, have your rear end bounce up by your head, and, and all of a sudden you land in a short period of time, and your eyeballs are bulging out. And of course, when you started, they uh, put me in this back seat with a parachute, because they said, here's this ring to pull, and how to get out in case the wing came off. Well, at that time, I wanted to get out of the aircraft. This first time they've been in a glider or a sailplane, and uh, it was all high-performance stuff and in the contest. So I didn't drop my cookies, but I don't know why. But I uh, hung on, and then they, after we stopped, they came to help me out, and I couldn't get out of the aircraft. I was wedged in with the parachute. <laughs> so I thought to myself, see, what if uh, the wing came off? I had to jump out like in the movies. I had no way I would have still sat in the airplane. <laughs> so, but that was his uh, major suite. I remember we went to quite a few glider meets, and that was one of the few times I went up did you ever personally make models yourself? Yeah, I made uh, my airplanes, and of course, since Dad was doing it, and he was always inspecting my inferior work, and, uh, but I did uh, do quite a few of Balsa Wood airplanes. That was a thing to do in those days. Uh, 
uh, when you're a teenager and grade school. Your father um, has a picture, a photograph of himself with what appears to be a flying saucer model. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me something about that? Yeah, well, he did all this. He would tell me about all these investigations of, uh, starting about 47 uh, on UFOs. Uh, and it was a year after he started the investigation, which was about July 1947, and I think about 1948, he uh, wrote this pact. And he made these model airplanes. Um, of, uh, one is a photograph you saw with the wings on it and a uh, large body, oval-shaped body with wings on it. Then he refined it, took the wings off, and just made stabilizers on the back end of it. And he cheated. He used some wind tunnel tests at Wright Pat to prove his design. So he kept modifying it to get it down to look like the UFOs he'd been investigating. So he and he knew it was a flyable thing because he actually saw these uh, UFOs. And he visited so many people who investigated them who had, had uh, sightings of them. And so he thought to himself. Uh, if someone else can do it, he can do it too. And then this research of the slides that you have is going back from, I think, 1898. The different countries like Russia, uh, England, Sweden, uh, their uh, parabolic uh, gliders, uh, and also parachutes, proving that such a design was practical. And he talked about the, the flying wing, but he said there's some instability with the flying wing, which I think the Horton brothers of Germany did. And then the Air Force finally came out with, I think they built two of them, and I saw some pictures in some Air Force magazines, and they were very unstable, but they did build two of them, and they flew them, I think, in the early 50s. But he said there were certain inherent design problems, and he said they would never work because it was just a flying wing. Did your father ever discuss with you uh, his low aspect ratio aircraft design? Oh, yeah, many times he would uh, talk about the uh, dihedrals and the angles and the low aspect. And later on in life, he got into stalls, short takeoff and landings, a type of uh, aircraft. But he um, he built these model airplanes and then flew them with both his rocket motors and then gasoline powered. I've seen him fly his, uh, like they said in the newspaper, the flying pumpkin. Mm -hmm. And um, he would fly them, uh, hand glide them first. And some of those would wobble, but uh, his concept was showing that uh, with the right power plants, he said the whole secret was having enough power plant. And he was only using a uh, either a, a puller or a pusher. Uh, the rocket engines were in the back, and that would be the pusher and the puller when he had the gasoline engines up in front of his his uh, flying ellipsoid. I call them this. As a parabolic design aircraft. Still kind of very yeah, right. saucer that, right. kind of shape. Yeah. I mean, and he proved that the shape was right, and then he said by, in his uh, patent, he says that with various slots, we could direct the uh, flow of the engine, whether down to the sides or up. And he says this way you could make 90 degree turns without any slippage. And there's times when he and I would be out at night, and we saw what he said were UFOs, these red lights up in the sky and they would make these name would be turns and says, see that's what they can do without any slippage. And then the Harriet Jets, the next time I thought about it, when I saw those in Atlanta at air shows in the late nineteen eighties, the British Harriet Jets were using somewhat the same concept by directing the flow of the jet engines and that's where they could hover and then take off. But they were very primitive concern compared to what my dad had in mind back in nineteen forty eight. The Harry Jets were an improvement from helicopters and current aircraft, but they still didn't have all the attributes of his patent show. Did the Air Force um, at any time, to your knowledge, um, show any interest in your father's low aspect ratio aircraft? Did, did they want it? Did they want it? I, uh, I don't know of any of that. He did. They did accept some of his designs, like putting the little uh, winglets on the refueling booms, because they're having a lot of uh, fighter crashes when they try to refuel them. So he designed this uh, little wings to put at the end of the boom to stabilize it, to give it uh, flying characteristics so it wouldn't whip around. And so he got a, uh, a 
apparently $250 for that design. I remember that. Uh, more is an award. Because all this work he did on the government's time, he couldn't have his own patents. And so I don't know how he got some of these patents in his name, uh, but the uh, the biggest one is uh, his, uh, his UFO model, his flying pumpkin seed, or his ellipsoid flying ellipsoid, or he did on his own, apparently. Were you with your dad when he tried out the, the flying saucer type model? <clears throat> oh, yes. Did you go to the wind tunnel test? No, no, I couldn't. I never, you, I never went to the right path. He snuck in and did that at yeah. after hours. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, he's had enough friends. I, mean, I think he did some at, um, at uh, Langley with his uh, stalls. Uh, he was modifying his own aircraft at the time. And um, he flew them as, as gliders first without power plants. And then he modified it, kept modifying his knowledge. So he got it down the way the, the patent was supposed to be. And uh, the big secret is power plants, and he said they have uh, UFOs that he knew about. They had a tremendous power, and they could do this. And they had a, uh, he said they used some type of magnetic field because when the UFOs got close to vehicles or radio transmitters, they cut off the uh, uh, car engine. And, and you know, it's a variety of if you've seen uh, people mention that too now. And, and he, would, would, your, would your father, when you're from talking to people who, who had a UFO sighting and that, would he talk to you about it? Yeah, he would confer it to me, um, and not too much of my brother. Uh, I, you know, I don't remember my brother being around some of these family meetings like that, or my father and I. And he would confer it to me, and I don't know how much to his mother, but I mean to his wife, but. Uh, she was not too concerned about all the technical aspects. But I happened to be an eager ear, and so I would be uh, someone he could talk to or through, whether I was there or not, this is talking anyway. And he had someone to, he said uh, he wanted to try out a theory, and he would use me as a bouncing board, just to someone to talk to, not that I could come back with any input when I was 13 or 14 years old. Did your father ever explain to you that some of the things and some of the work that he was doing was was classified? Did yeah, and, he's and, and, and specifically, did he ever tell you that what I'm telling you, you're not to tell anyone? Uh, yeah, I think he said many times it was uh, classified work, and he's working on his uh, UFO investigation. He did a lot of travel. He did mention Dr. Goddard's name. And then, of course, when uh, after the war, they uh, bring in German scientist Walter von Braun. He said he wasn't that much of a, a good rocket scientist, but he was a good administrator. And he says there are better brains like Dr. Walter Lippisch. And he said Von Braun wasn't a great aeronautical man, but he was a good administrator. And he says there are a need for people like that, too. Let's talk about Lippisch for a moment. Um, you said that Dr. Lippisch would come over to the house. Could you tell me about that? Well, that would just, I remember that's just the one time it was a big thing to have a... Uh, an enemy crowd come over to the house. Dad <coughs> uh, had mentioned about uh, interviewing these uh, rocket scientists, and he thought very highly of them. And there was a group of them, I forget how many, whether 12 or so, that they brought to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And uh, that was a big dinner. I don't remember much about it, just that this Dr. Walter Lippisch was at the house, and it was very pleasant. And, and of course, uh, like most non-Americans, everybody can speak more than one language, so this man was versed in German, and of course English was very good too at the time. So your father spoke a lot of German in the house? No, no, no there's no German spoken, but the, the, the uh, Dr. Lippisch was bilingual, and most people you meet in other countries know more than one language. Americans only know one language, and that's badly, that's English. <laughs> very true, yeah. very true. Uh, and I don't, I, I never... I, I have tried to learn French, Spanish. I, I just have no knack mm. to pick up another language. Well, I learned Spanish by accident when I was, uh, Texaco sent me to Central America. I had to learn Spanish. Real quick, huh? Well, if you were in the bar <laughs> drinking and you want to go to the bathroom, you you got to do something. That's a story. <laughs> uh, did, uh, did Lupesh ever talk to you personally? I mean... No, that was just the was one just time I remember in dinner, and I was just in awe about having a foreigner sitting in the house. And 
at the time under Project Paperclip, when they were bringing engineers, uh, German engineers and scientists back to the United States, um, there was a prisoner of war camp in Dayton at the time. Obviously not all of these scientists or engineers were there. Most of them ended up in New Mexico, um, at the White Sands, El Gordo area, and that, a few of them stayed on at Wright-Patterson. Um, did you and your father ever visit uh, the German POW camp there in Dayton? No, I never knew there was a POW camp. I just, I just assumed they all had their housing arranged for them. They were never, it was never discussed, or I recall that they were prisoners of war. They just uh, repatriated or what you want to call it. Did your dad ever talk uh, to Marian, his wife, uh, about UFOs? And, and what did your mother think about it and about your father's <coughs> I don't remember any input. Uh, they never did seem to discuss it. Uh, dad always used me as his confidant. Uh, it was never seemed to be discussed at the uh, dinner tables. Uh, it was always when he and I were by ourselves, which was usually in the basement or outside when I was working on his car or something like that. So it was not a, a family uh, discussion. Really. Was there any UFO case that your dad went <coughs> to investigate that he was very, very excited about that he told you about? Uh, yeah, we're always interested in, in certain things and this that, but every once in a while there's something that really jumps out and a person really gets super excited. I'd say about every trip he came back, he was excited about every sighting he saw. And he really believed that the UFOs were real. He went into a lot of investigations, and they were phony things. Someone used a pie dish and made a bad uh, photograph of it. And so, you know, 80% of the investigations were those. And people asked me about the little green man at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, but we had a funeral basement. <laughs> no, my dad's drinking buddies. But um, I think with dad's nature that he was very serious and very truthful. And he confided in me all the sightings he, he saw in his visit to Hamburgoro and, and New Mexico and Dr. Goddard and Walter Von Braun and all these people I met. And he never hid anything from me. Now, he never wanted to bring home paperwork. I never saw any classified documents. I never saw any work at other than the, his own engineering drawings. So in those days, it's different than the industrial espionage done today. I think all those people were very uh, security-minded, and they did not bring papers home. And so that's why I don't think you'd find any documents lying around. Did your dad ever mention uh, to you a report that supposedly was done by the Project Sign? Um, team, of which he was the civilian head of, uh, called the estimate of the situation? No, I didn't find out about that till later, but he did make a comment that he sent a report to Washington, and later I found that this was called the estimate. But he talked about that it was his report, and later we find there's no signatures. Uh, it's always these other people who were signing things for him, which has always irritated him. But he did make the report, and he said it went up to Washington. I think it was, I'm going to say it's probably uh, May or June of the time of year. It could have been 48, uh, 49. And he was very upset that Washington shut it down and made no comment about it. So, so that I'm real clear on this now, your father told you about a report that he made yes. and sent yes. to the Pentagon. And that, did he mention any names on who he sent it to? No, and it was, uh, he said it was hushed up. Okay, and, but he didn't give you a title of no. this document. No. Then, but later on, when you first heard about the estimate of the situation, then you kind of put two and two together. Yes, that, that, that was that a, probably was, same your, thing. was your dad's report. Yeah. yeah, he put the report. But going back, uh, you're asking the other question about his uh, investigation of UFOs. He would go to one site, and it would... Uh, where something had been landed and it was blackened grass and had high, high uh, sulfur smells. And he had wanted to, uh, several occasions where he investigated sites like that. And he told me one time he thought the, uh, the aliens or the UFO occupants could actually be insects. I don't know. Did, did he give you a reason? No, I was going to say uh, because I of the ice. I thought that because in, in ufology, 
there have been others who think that UFOs might even be animals living in the atmosphere. Well, that's what I was um, alluding to, I think, that when he found these burnt areas with high sulfur smells, he thought it could have been like the old dragons uh, over here in mythology. There was something that uh, was animal-like, or the insect-like, because he knew of the pressures they had to do uh, withstand in these, uh, in these vessels they traveled in. But if you look at some of the old UFO movies, and they always have these uh, little creatures in these helmets, and if anything looks different than you and me, we think it's weird. And of course, I'm sure this creature's looking at us, thinking we're weird. But there's, um, he definitely believed that the UFOs exist and were real. He definitely believed there was something uh, uh, that maneuvered them and it was real, whether man-like or insect-like. But if it looked a little bit different, um, to withstand the pressures of space, they could look uh, assumed to be like insects. With a hard shell. Or With a hard shell, and, 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 and they would look different on us. Makes a lot of sense. And, um, but he never mentioned anything about abductions of people, any of his investigations. These were sightings where uh, state police officers, Air Force pilots who investigate commercial airline pilots, and he knew that they were telling uh, the truth of their sightings. Was there ever um, a time that your dad told you about uh, going to Newfoundland no. to investigate a sighting? Well, he mentioned he went to a lot of different places, but uh, I, I don't remember Newfoundland. But he did say uh, he was amazed how the electric motors, or I mean uh, car motors, were stopped. And these anti-magnetic well, What did he say about that, other than it was just anti-magnetic? <clears throat> we felt they, there was a strong magnetic uh, force that were driving these uh, UFO uh, vehicles. And it had to do with magnetism and anti-magnetic fields. And to fly all these distances, I always felt that uh, you had to change matter to go the distances to space. My dad thought they had to be very strong power plants in his vehicles to make them perform as they did. And typically, he always used the deal of making a 90 degree turn without any slippage. Do you remember your father ever talking to the press or the media or seeing uh, photographers at the house or anything? No. The only ones I saw were those newspaper clippings where they interviewed him in Richmond, Virginia, I think. Mike Hall, my associate, ran across a newspaper article dealing with your mother and your father back in 1932. Huh. They saw an unidentified flying object. Uh, did your parents ever talk to you about that? No. No? Okay. I'd like to read it to you, All right. if I could. Uh, it's kind of abbreviated, but almost all of it's there. In October 1932, the couple, your mother and father, saw such an object one evening while driving near Plainsboro, New Jersey, he reported. At first they thought an aircraft was crashing nearby. Then the craft leveled off and flashed away at high speed, emitting a changing bluish-green light. On returning to his home, he immediately sketched the object from memory. Later, he said former New York Congressman L. G. Clemente reported he had seen an object at about the same time. Loading estimated the object he and his wife had seen was about 100 feet in diameter and 500 to 600 feet high up in the air. He said the object gave off a weird light, like, a, like looking at a firefly that appeared to change shape. He said he had seen nothing of a similar nature since. And your father or your mother never never talked about that? I never remember at all my mother saying anything about UFOs or David or talking to her in, in my presence. Do you think he might have? Yeah, I guess so. I don't see why, you know, why he wouldn't. So, so that he saw uh, many of the sightings uh, and interviewed people, and uh, most of it was secondhand. Although he and I had looked at some back in the skies at night. But uh, he was intensely interested in all the interviews he went on, especially the ones that were uh, authentic. And he really believed. Uh, did did he ever explain to you how, when he came back from 
investigating some of the cases, how he arrived at whether he thought the, it could have been a joke or uh, a hoax or why he thought certain ones were authentic? Um, well, because of the, 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 the people he talked with, the credibility of them, and being the, the, the scientist that he was, he could see through the hoaxes that he'd say, well, oh, these are just a phony photograph. It was a, a saucer pan someone threw up in the air. And the people he talked with had a lot of credibility, the uh, state patrol people, the airline people, the uh, aviation, Air Force people he talked with, that they had no reason to uh, you know, give them false information. To your knowledge, did uh, your father ever investigate a case that where a UFO was observed by a military, by military personnel. Yeah, so. Yes, yes. What did he say about that one? Do you remember when when this was? Well, this is a. Uh, most of the times when he came back, he had talked to uh, Air Force or uh, Army people, or State Patrol, or at least the qualified people, or airline commercial airline pilots. So he talked to those people, and uh, he knew that they, what they saw were were real. And he, and the, all the sightings seemed to fit together. They all had similar circumstances, you know, they you know, like fit the odds of cars stopping and so forth, and the flashing blue lights, and how they could uh, move so fast and, and uh, get away or hover near an aircraft and, and disappear very fast. Did your father ever to you if the Air Force or the Army or whatever had ever recovered? One of these objects? No, he never mentioned that. Uh, and I think if there was something like that, he would have told me because he was treated in confidence everything else he saw uh, and, uh, and his uh, viewpoints. And if there were any crashes or green people, he would have mentioned that. Because all, everything he was doing was under uh, secret clearance at that time. All the investigations, as you know, the whole project. Very, uh, and, and something like that, he would have really, he wouldn't be able to hold it in. He would have to tell me uh, about something like that. Uh, he, he would have to tell you. He, yeah. He, could, he wouldn't be able to keep something yeah, like that uh, in. Because he told me about all these other sightings. And, yeah. and the, uh, the most remarkable ones were the sulfur fumes, the burnt areas. He couldn't explain that. Other than he thought. That the occupants might be insect-like. Well, that's what in that's what he thought. It was a high uh, hydrogen sulfide fumes. That's what it related. It could be uh, insect or animal. But he said normally, uh, if a, uh, a a flying machine like that, the propulsion would land in place naturally with burning grass. I want to get back a little bit back to uh, right. Field or Wright Patterson after it became after the uh, Army Air Corps switched over and became a separate body uh, known as the United States Air Force. Then it switched all the bases, switched over to Air Force Base, mm -hmm. so it became Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Um, are there any recollections at all that you have of ever going onto the base or visiting your dad's office? Or? No, um, I never made it to his uh, office and. Uh, I don't recall being on the base. I've been by it, but I've never been on it. I never saw the office. I got the impression he was happier to be away from the right path than to go on in his spare time. And I think he looked very forward to being home on his own and doing his own little work. He liked to try. He liked to do the traveling, though, did he not? Yeah. Uh, you, you stated that you had never heard the term Project Sign mentioned before. Um, that you had always known it as Project Blue Book. Yes. And, um, Matter of fact, my file I keep uh, has Project Blue Book written on it, which I've been keeping for years. Did your father ever mention a project called Grudge? No. Those are all the new names I found out in the last year or two. Ah, okay. Sign the grudge. So, so I've taken it then that when your father talked to you about some of the things that he did, where he went to, he really never gave you names, but just what went on and you know, yes. some of the exciting things about mm -hmm. it. Okay. 
he mentioned the only name was the officers in charge that he had to work to was the colonel's side. Did he ever mention a, a captain, um, Robert Schneider? No, I don't recall that. Miles Gall? Um, it was interesting that, uh, that uh, Hoyt Vandenberg, who was the uh, commander of the general thing, sent the estimate of his final report. He called it his final report. Now, now let me ask you, let me stop you for a second real quick. Because I really want to make sure I got this. Your father, by himself, wrote the report? Yes. Okay. That's what he told me. It was his report. The reason, I, the, reason, the reason that's important is that sheds an awful lot of new light on things. Because we've always assumed that the report itself was the whole sign team writing the report. And this might not necessarily be so. See, now, so this is something you really have to start looking into. See, my dad uh, always told me it was his project and he was directing this project. And that memo in, 19, in July 1947 showed that he was called in to start the investigation. Right, with Dr. Charles Carroll. And, and then uh, and the rest of the time he said it was his project, it was his report. And once he got back uh, to uh, Wright Pat in 1955, he never again mentioned the folks. Do you know why? Uh, <clears throat> he was very upset in 51, I think that was when he was in 50, 51. And then he got, uh, you see the uh, personnel reports, and he started getting on bad uh, ratings. And uh, then he made a uh, moral deal about getting his rating upgraded. And uh, then he got eased out, just like any old corporations, you know, when they want somebody out. So they eased him out, and that's when he got into the Phenomix uh, Chemical Company. But he came back to Wright Pat one year after General Vandenberg died. Vandenberg died in 54, Dad came back to Wright Pat in 55. Very interesting. And Did he, he ever tell you why? No. Did he get back? Did he become a little more secretive <clears throat> at that point? No, and then when with Langley, and of course I think Michael Loading uh, thought maybe he was assigned to Langley uh, near Williamsburg, Virginia, uh, to help train the uh, astronauts and learning what to do with the uh, anti UFOs. But it was never discussed when he was at uh, Langley. He never mentioned his work. But it was also at the uh, astronaut training at that time. But he never again mentioned uh, UFOs when he was down to cancel the students or a lot of the his work. He was so dedicated to it, you know, in the early days, from 47 to 50. And then just all of a sudden, they stopped. When they, did, did you, but his report went up to Did you ever ask him? No. He didn't want to discuss it, and he was so heartbroken that his, uh, his report to Washington got uh, squelched and got hushed up. He did mention that several times. Did he, when you say that he felt heartbroken, did he, did he ever go into detail? No. <clears throat> well, knowing with all the stories you told me about all his trips, uh, this was a major project on He believed there was something there that was real. There was an aeronautical breakthrough from the pure professionalism. He thought that was better than sliced bread. And they're on the frontier of uh, uh, new aerodynamics, propulsion systems, and the whole ball of wax. And all of a sudden it was put down. Okay, so immediately after uh, he sent his report and, and Vandenberg shot it down, did that also affect your father's attitude as far as designing aircraft again? Did he stop designing aircraft and, and go off and do other things at that point? I guess so looking back, uh, you're probably right, because I never knew he got laid off and fired from uh, right path. And, uh, you know, the personnel records don't show it. It shows indications. All of a sudden, his, uh, his ratings started going down. And I've seen this in the corporate life. And they started putting pressure on him. So one, how, one way or another, he got out. And, uh, but when we <laughs> moved to New Jersey, uh, I never saw him 
do that much more work in the drawing boards because he was doing more house projects out in the yard and things like that. So you just really kind of seemed to you to have lost interest. Yeah, and, and then at that time he took up flying when he was 50, and then uh, when he died in Williamsburg, he had his own airplane there and he brought it into the garage. And uh, he was uh, taking the wings off and making stall, you know, short takeoff and landing, and uh, trying to modify his aircraft. He spent more time on that than actual uh, uh, design or, or drafting type of work. He spent his last few years more on uh, short takeoff and landing the aircraft and doing his own flying. Do you recall if your father ever received any kind of special attention during the war years? Um, from scientists or high-ranking military people? Um, did he mention any time that, gosh, you know, I've been selected to do this or I've been selected to do that or they really enjoyed my work or whatever it is? I'm not talking about after 1948. I'm talking about after <coughs> 1947. Uh, no, I don't. Uh, those days aren't too clear with me, except I know he did some traveling uh, during the war. And what did he do? Did he I don't, ever tell you? No, I just military trips. He flew in military aircraft. I brought you information um, on the hydro bomb because your father uh, uh, mentioned that he worked on the hydro bomb. And that, um, did he ever talk to you openly about his work on the hydro bomb? No, it wasn't until I saw some information about that a couple of years ago. And that the information I saw never did explain what it, the hydro bomb was. He never, he, never that. He, he never mentioned anything about, uh, and of course he started up the Jet Propulsion Laboratory too, which I didn't know about. He originated that. Uh, but he only um, talked about the, uh, the UFO project on the road and uh, on his work. And the other work was his model aircrafts and uh, airplane building and his models. Your dad obviously gave a, have, have like 120 slides that he used. Um, what kind of lectures did he give and who did he give these lectures and talks to? I didn't really know those until I uh, uh, got them from my mother, I think. And then I had them in storage for, for 30 years until I uh, dug them out of the storage I had in here. And that's the first time I looked at them in years. Did your dad ever, ever say what groups and that he actually talked to? Or? No. Uh, back in those days, uh, he mentioned you know, uh, Dr. Goddard and Walter Von Braun, and I in this slide show a picture of him, Goddard Air Force Base. But he never mentioned the slides. I didn't know they existed until I got them after he died. And I didn't realize all the patents he had made either. But he kept, uh, I know he had the patent attorney who was always coming back and forth to him, too. I want to ask you about this flying saucer model again. There are two models we carried with us for several years, and we got, both got broken up, I think, in the last move. The, uh, the one with the, uh, it was a red, the one of the first rocket models, red wings with a red the body, and then the, uh, the, the UFO type of model. How, how, how big was it actually? Oh, I guess it was probably about two feet high, or you know, lip sort of type of thing. And, and from the photograph, all we have is black and white. Mm -hmm. Did he paint it in any specific color? Or? Yeah, well, there's some color. Maybe he had some bridge in it, and then there was also wood with uh, fabric, you know, a regular... Uh, also type of uh, aircraft. Uh, in other words, he would make the internal structure <coughs> out, of, mm -hmm. out of balsa wood. Right, and framing covered, and all, and covered, covered with, with tissue, yeah. And tissue did, did he did show the engines in that? No, he had, um, he had a, a, a rocket mounts in the back of the, the other models where you could see the passengers. Uh, he had have a gasoline powered motor up in there. But he flew regular uh, uh, model airplanes, right? Was the model itself, did he have it so that he could separate it, so that you could look inside of it? No, just the, uh, the front where you cover up the engine, the gasoline engine. But the rest of it was just uh, uh, the 
it's all fabric color. It wasn't that. Well, it's three dimensional, but it wasn't. You could you couldn't take it apart. Oh, okay. And it was uh, David one is some some models people build. Yeah. yeah they can take take apart and say, well, here are the seating arrangements mm -hmm. and the power plant. Well, he couldn't uh, operate the slots so if he wanted to direct the power, and that was according to this patent. So the plane wobbled a little bit, unless it went uh, fast enough, then it was stable and flight. But you could imagine that if he could have a sufficient power plant that he talked about, that he could, the aircraft could do all the things he talked about. Because it was, being an ellipsoid, it had like a leading edge around the whole circumference. So that's why you'd go any direction and it'd be like a fine plane. All right, so, so we know that, that your father kind of went on base after hours to check out his design. Well, whether well, it was after hours or during the time, or during some friends, yeah. But, but he used the facilities at, at Wright-Patterson to uh, the wind tunnel and that mm -hmm. to check out his design. I think that's really neat. Um, did this model actually fly? I mean, did he put actual small solid propellant rockets or engines or gasoline engines or anything to actually see if it would actually fly. Oh, yeah, that's what he said. He actually flew them, and I saw them fly both with the rocket motors and the gasoline And, and they just wobbled just a little bit? Yeah, it wobbled a little bit, but then it would uh, fly and take off and then uh, and land in the, after the gasoline engine uh, fuel works on the door, or the rocket motors are suspended. Do you remember how the, how the gasoline engines actually work? I mean, was it kind of a... Uh, a, a thrust, or was it a propeller inside? Well, it was just or? a propeller hit it near the front where the passenger and the joint the passenger would be. Get the motor sitting there for the propeller out front. So it operated just like any other model airplane. Okay. Now, the pumpkin seat, was that the, the actual toy no, that the, he developed? The pumpkin seat, what the press called it, I think after Richmond, Virginia, the press report, they call it the flying pumpkin seat. But that was the actual flying model. Oh, okay. All the models he made, either they flew or he broke them up and built another one. If it didn't fly, he didn't show it around. Because everybody wanted to say, well, can you sail it? He'd take it up and sail it through the air. So the, so the, so the model of the, of the flying saucer looking crap, probably yeah. see, whatever, was that, did he design that for just for it to be a toy, or did he design that? Um, to maybe show his superiors. Well, he thought it could be a uh, production type of aircraft. He wanted to prove the feasibility that it was viable in aeronautical and sound. That's why he made that intensive uh, patent. If you go through it and read that, there's a lot of technical jargon in that. But from that, he, he proved the patent by actually flying the model, both as uh, without power and with power. But he also he thought, it, he, he thought it would also make a good toy? Kids? No, no, he no. never thought of it as a toy. It was just a, a, a engineering aeronautical breakthrough. And he thought of it being the answer to uh, a family uh, aircraft. He talked about that down the road. This, this would be a, a family way to put... And some of his drawings show uh, uh, three or four people, family people, sitting in the front. I think uh, so he's kind of like to replace cars. <coughs> yeah, yeah. The yeah. That would be a light aircraft for, that, that, would, that everybody could use because it uh, you wouldn't have the problems of uh, airfields. That, uh, you could land it in your backyard. That's what I said because the propulsion plant and, and the way you don't need a long takeoffs or runways or anything else. Hover would be a hovercraft. Would be very useful. As that's a family vehicle. So that's what uh, that's what he envisioned it as. So he's trying to put something that he investigated under Project Blue Book, the Project Sign, as UFOs, to make a practical application. And this is an aeronautical breakthrough. Based everybody. upon his forward-thinking designs prior or during the war, or prior to the or war, which he stole from and UFOs. Then, yeah, and then, <clears throat> and then when the UFO phenomenon, the flying disks started being observed uh, in 1940, end of 46, beginning of 47. Then he thought, wow, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll probably get sued for by the UFOs now because of the basketball that he designs. I see a discrimination suit or something. He said that green people have me in court. But no, he, um, he was able to assemble a data, but you know, he went back as far as Nostradamus in the sightings of UFOs. That's back a thousand years. Did your dad actually do a lot of reading, too, and a lot of research? Yeah, apparently, he did research back in, in, in Nostradamus. I forget that, that era that was. That must have been a thousand years ago. Um, and he followed up. 1452, I think. Yeah, I think just shortly after I was born. But, uh, but he did a lot of research that way. Shortly after you were born. I'm sorry, I'm sitting here doing an interview. It went right over my head. <laughs> but, Mike, uh, you need to be here. This is great. But he was, uh, no, he, he did all that research, you know, that was something there, and I chided Mike. Well, why cover just a hundred years of UFO site? It's been going on for centuries. And that's what people forget, and even over in, in Peru, all those carvings and the rocks, they thought they could only be done by, uh, by uh, UFOs. You know, gouging out the rocks. <coughs> and some of the sketches they show look like people like astronauts. Yeah. The Incas and all that. Did your dad, after 1950, did you ever see your dad read any books that were coming out around that time on UFOs? No. I don't remember ever seeing a, a book on UFOs in those days. Um, and I never did see dad, you know, pick up a book like I'm trying to read here with uh, Redstone Light. He was not a bookworm. Anything he read uh, had to be a technical journal or something. And he just kind of, uh, it was like a uh, uh, scientific sponge. He just assimilated the information into him. And he talked to people. And you can see that he was turning their brains inside out. He wouldn't ask a question unless he uh, wanted the, the, the right answer. And he just assimilated the information that everybody talked to. And so when he talked to uh, these German scientists <coughs> and uh, Dr. Goddard and anybody else, just bringing it all in like a sponge and trying to put it into the perspective and come up with something practical. He was not going into theoretical stuff as much as what's a practical use of it. So he would not build a the pumpkin seed or a UFO model to be a toy for kids. He wanted something that could prove it could fly and had a practical application. And all of his inventions apparently were that like just like the ringlets with a retrieving and of course, his brother uh, Herb uh, was an engineer. And he designed the first uh, gentry, the gent, um, gentry was it, or the thing that helped the uh, spaceships on the gentry. The gentry, yeah. He designed that thing. Uh, and he had his own engineering firm, and then his business went down the tube. Did your dad ever? Did your dad ever help? No, they were doing two separate. Areas. When they get together, they would uh, talk shop once in a while, you know, on their summer vacations. But Herb was very intense, too. And, uh, Do you know if Herb believed in the I don't know what he talked to his brothers about. But uh, Herb was more uh, practical. Uh, and uh, I guess Freddie was a go between in the thought of uh, Uncle Buddy Charles, though, and as the youngest. So I don't know how much they had confided. Uh, uh, Charles, but I'm sure Fred would have some good input. His other brother is John, but he's, he's older now and he's had some health problems. But I think both uh, between uh, Fred and Charles, both of them wanted to give some input. Dad and Charles. So, uh, as a family reunion, so, you know, nothing was, they had some these newspaper clippings and all on. Uh, the tables, you know, for each of the brothers in the background. And of course, they had those bodies of my pumpkin seed, you know, those were. And, uh, but not much was ever mentioned in the family meetings to more about that. And his, my uncles, his brothers, uh, never confided in anything about too much about the UFOs or anything. Have just a couple more questions. Sure. Your father was what was it about your dad that just you admired absolutely? I guess his uh, 
dedication to uh, to his work, but uh, I guess more to his uh, ideals that he had set for himself. Uh, he wanted to be a perfectionist in aviation. Uh, and it's unfortunate he waited to the age of 50 before he started to fly, because then he could really feel uh, an assimilation of all his work. He was going to be very fluid, you know, non-technical type of aircraft, like the you know, Alonka Champ and the Type of J-5, and the PA-17, which I, he had me fly in, and it flew like a damn brook. <laughs> and he's always flying these sloppy J-3s, the big wingspans. And uh, he had this PA-17, which was a very short coupled airplane, short fuselage, short wings. So when you, and you cut the power, it just glided like a brick. And when you uh, took off or landed, you had to walk the pedals because they, uh, they wanted to rotate on you. It was very difficult to the airplane to the air and land. But he wanted me to solo it, and I made three landings, and I got out of it, and so I ain't going to go back up that way. Because I bounced all over the place. The, that worked for his ideal he had. He wanted to be a, be a perfectionist in aeronautical science and do as much good he could for the advancement of that science. So all his work, he, he went 110% into it to prove ideas, prove hypotheses, and do that type of achievement. And that was his, uh, his goal in life, his ideal. Uh, putting everything else aside, his dedication to his ideal and his work was his major goal. Uh, fame was secondary. Uh, friends were secondary. He had a few friends. But his, uh, his really love was working hard and working to yeah. And as a man, it, it, you couldn't buy, you couldn't buy him off an idea. And that's why he got his problems with his superiors all the time because he said, "This is right." And uh, that's the old German, uh, "We have our orders," you know. And down to torpedoes, he was going to prove his point. And he was so sure of what he did, and he was uh, looking back, he was never wrong. Anything you said or did. Do you think that this might have been one of the reasons that later on in the 50s that uh, his evaluations might have started to go down? Because obviously his evaluations, uh, and we had them, of course, yeah. were excellent, above excellent. Well, he had one man. And then there was that slide. 48, I think it was named Rogers, who reevaluated for him and got him back up to a good rating. But I think he had the personality. Uh, conflicts there, and I probably, I've got the views that people up in Washington still put the pressure on him and get him out. Because it was all of a sudden, he was a fair-haired boy for years there, and all of a sudden, once he, the, uh, the estimate of the situation, his report went to Washington, is when they put the kibosh on him, and he was a broken man. Maybe, and you actually witnessed this, Jeffrey, yeah. saw the deterioration. Yeah. And then we went to a mix of chemical company, and I worked there in the summer job when it was at Ohio State, and they moved to Heightstown, New Jersey, and then to Princeton. And um, there was nothing but a munitions factory. We made, uh, they made 500-pound uh, napalm bombs there. And I worked in the yards uh, putting together uh, uh, stands for it, you know, uh, oak planking with 500-pound bombs. And he was the director of jet propulsion, but there, you didn't see anything. They made fireworks and they made napalm bombs. And I think the company probably hired him there and gave him a, a good pay to influence in Washington trying to get some uh, contracts or, uh, you know, government contracts. <coughs> but I never saw any. There's no jet engines or anything else there. Although he was the director of jet propulsion. He had a very kind of very small office there, typical little factory munitions. And then when your father went, went back to write letters, did that surprise your mother also? Um, I don't remember getting the vibes uh, from them. They, uh, they went back to uh, Ohio. Of course, they, I guess a few friends there. And I'm sure he took quite a cut in pay. But I don't know what happened to Unexcelled, whether, uh, whether the country went bankrupt. I think they had some financial problems. And so he kind of crept back into right pack for security. 
And he always talked lovingly of being a civil servant, working for the government. He says it added stability and security. And uh, he was always looking to be uh, retired when he was 65. That was his whole goal, too, to be retired. Talking about that, did he ever indicate to you after retirement what he wanted to do? What his goals and dreams might have been after? No. Now, in those later years before he died, he, was, he really got a kick out of flying his own airplane and actually doing aviation stuff in the air, hands on. So, but he always liked the security of the. Uh, he never showed any uh, bitterness going back, but he was very thankful he got a job got back. And then was, I don't know how it worked out, but he got transferred to London and they moved to Williamsburg. He liked Williamsburg and he liked his work with NASA. He was a liaison, U.S. Air Force liaison officer with NASA. And he had a very good boss there. That's uh, kind of like a French name, but he I can't think of it at all. But he was very happy there because I remember he died in the cancer at the time. But it was. Uh, It was interesting how he <clears throat> seemed to get back to the right path right after his, uh, his nemesis passed away back in the early years before. But being a, you know, a son and child, we didn't talk wait, much wait, about wait, the transition. Let me interrupt you for a second. When you say his nemesis, Vandenberg, did he ever talk about Vandenberg? I mean, out loud? <clears throat> no, he just, that was the Washington, the people, and later I found out who the Washington people were. The last few years, but he never mentioned that. And he just said Washington. And he always kind of disliked Washington. Yeah, well, because they, that's the only time he mentioned badly about him because about his report. Did he ever mention a Dr. Charles Carroll? No, I don't recall that name. Yeah, they could have, but you know, it's been so many years ago. I just, you know, the, the major military men I remember was Major Sweet. I took my uh, flying machine, but I know this. <coughs> yeah. Uh, when I was in Civil Air Patrol, um, just swap stories here. When I was in Civil Air Patrol, um, a guy, came, a pilot came in to our local air show, and he was in a, a bi-wing aircraft, open cockpit. He says, hey, you want to go out? I said, sure. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I've been used to flying, but never did I ever get back on the ground and my Lake for wobbling around, and I, I must have walked across that flight line like a bowl full of jelly. I was just looking. This guy did loops oh. and you know barrel rolls and to the ground. You know, and it was, oh, so I can imagine, you know, what was going on with the glider. <laughs> yeah, those biplanes give you a trip. Oh, all the wind brushing your yeah. face. And, and the noise was deafening. Matter of fact, I got my oldest son in we Costa Rica. I got him a flight in a uh, Stearman biplane. And uh, fortunately, there wasn't enough time for me to go up because I didn't want to go up in the Stearman, but my son did, and he really enjoyed the flight. But, uh, you know, going back to uh, Einstein in Princeton, when my folks lived there, uh, I almost ran over uh, uh, Einstein. He was coming out of the liquor store. He walked between two parked cars, had a bottle of uh, whiskey in a paper bag. He stepped right in front of my car. <laughs> that was a, a stone college, college at Ohio State. And he just <laughs> slammed on the brakes. He was right in the hood of my car and just looked at me. And, and I said, oh, my God, I must kill Einstein. <laughs> did, did your dad know Albert Einstein? No, I don't know if he did or not. But he was there in Princeton. That's when my dad was still at Hennix of Kimmel. But uh, he was... MC Squared almost got squashed with his liquor bottle in his hands. I claim the thing. What a good trip to history. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, Mike's just, Mike's just gonna love this. <laughs> I'm gonna have to, uh, I'm gonna get to a good physicist or a good <laughs> library and find out uh, uh, his theory of unified particles. I read briefly about it, but I think there's, he was on the threshold of uh, how we can. Uh, go to uh, speed is like uh, Jonathan Livingston Siegel said speed is being there 
You have to think about that. That's what space travel is all about. Someone it has to go faster than the speed of light. Well, obviously you've read about this, so let me ask you this question. If, if you're in a car that can go the speed of light, what happens when you turn the headlights on? It's dark. <laughs> <laughs> Don, God bless you and thank you very, very much. I appreciate it very, very much. Your father was a remarkable man. He was.